The actual solar system itself, each of the planets was designed with purpose and to be in harmony with the Earth. Mm -hmm. So Saturn produces frequencies that were designed to uh, bring about a replenishing atmosphere on the Earth. Mm. Uh, other planets had different purposes, um, but those purposes have been corrupted. So first of all, our responsibility is to restore the balance and harmony and the relationship between the planets and to see those planets begin to function and bring harmony so that the Earth and the, the planet and the solar system can be a pattern for the rest of the universe. I do have a question, if that's OK. Yeah. Could you say a little bit about how the physical universe, obviously, it's a copy of this spiritual in some way. But in terms of how we are impacting the physical universe with our spiritual sphere, our personal, you know, spirit and soul, can mm -hmm. you say a little bit about what that looks like in terms of how that impacts our bodies? But even, and I hope this doesn't sound too strange, but how that impacts like our homes and the land that we're living on and even like our pets. Right. Um, well, if you're creating a dynamic of peace around you, um, mm -hmm. And you're operating that sense of peace from the inside out. So you're flowing and creating an energy field of life around you, rivers of living water flowing for your innermost being. Then that is going to create a frequency that begins to connect with creation mm. and can create a sense of peace and harmony around you. So in your home and affect creation around you. But then you have to be intentional in its focus. Okay. So it's a matter of um, focusing that intention directly towards that which you want to uh, and legislate into, administrate into, bring blessing into. Um, so in general, as we come into our identity as sons, creation begins to respond to us. So our the frequency of our sonship, our identity. Um, it begins to connect to creation, the creational reality, and then it begins to spawn to us as we then speak as an oracle of God. So we have to communicate the heart of God. Uh, and when we speak from his heart, then creation responds to us, light responds to us, we begin to form and create realities around us. But when we're looking to create a reality, we've got to ensure that that reality is aligned to the father's heart, which means only doing what we see or feel or sense the father doing rather than just choosing what we want or what we might want to do. So it's important to always engage the father before we engage reality around us so that we're administrating that reality um, correctly. Um, but in general, the more we mature, the more we grow in our sonship, the more creation will respond to us. But we can be intentional and focusing that reality around our lives. So in the spheres that we have responsibility for, our family, maybe workplace, home, any area that we have, a, we have government in, we can intentionally engage that realm to bring mm. peace and rest into it. And if we're at peace and rest, we'll then create an atmosphere of peace and rest in which to live. And that will in, inevitably affect other people around us in a positive way. Um, but that being said, you can't control other people. They still have to respond in, in agreement, if you like. When there's agreement in people and union, then you begin to find blessing manifested. Um, where there's tension and conflict, then it tends to disrupt that field, um, which we can maintain around our own lives, even in a sense of tension with others. We don't have to be affected by other people's stuff and frequency. But if we're going to come in any sense of a wider field, then there's got to be an agreement for that to operate um, in a wider sense, which is why generally it doesn't, because there's not much agreement. Um, but when people are in harmony and in that sense of union, then we can expect blessing around us and in the spheres we are. And we can bring that frequency to a place, to a workplace, to a home, 
but then other people need to engage with it. Even if they don't really understand, they can still come into an agreement with it because everyone wants peace generally. Mm -hmm. And if they feel and sense an atmosphere in a place, then they'll feel more able to connect in that sort of atmosphere, really. Mm -hmm. How do they engage, Mike? I'm sorry, I'm a little starstruck. <laughs> um, um, how do oh. they engage if they don't understand that piece? Like they're sensing it. How do they engage yeah. it if they don't get it? Well, some of it is just that inner sense of rest and agreement in it. Uh, obviously, the more people know and the more people are able to specifically and intentionally engage, then the more that has a positive effect on their lives. But in general, if we're creating a positive, peace-filled atmosphere and they sense that and they're at rest in that, then, then they're going to benefit from it. Mm. Yeah. So sometimes, you know, people don't have to be intentional themselves other than this is good <laughs> okay yeah. so they're participating they're agreeing yeah. with it yeah. just by acknowledging yeah. this is something that i oh, because it's the principle of desire and focus yeah absolutely okay. um now obviously if you want to help people create their own atmosphere and their own place of rest then they need to know how to generate that and that really involves life flowing from god you know, you mm. can't really generate your own peace outside of the Prince of Peace, if you like. Because um, they have to be, right, resting and abiding yeah. in. Yeah. But mm -hmm. they can still benefit from being in your presence and in your sphere where you rule and where you establish a place of blessing. What about our physical bodies? How does it impact just ourselves? Well, our physical bodies... If we're living in a generated field of energy can be replenished and can live in an in a mortal state. Yes. So physical bodies do not have to be subject to death or being tethered to death. Yes. We generate that energy that from within and we live within the field of energy we are creating around us. So we can generate uh a field of immortality that we can live in so it can affect our whole physical body and it affects even the stuff that's around us too right like the wet yeah. the ripples are going out and affecting even our homes and like our children and our pets and whatever yeah it can, it can definitely have a positive effect okay. um, and the more you are operating out of your identity in sonship the greater that effect is mm. But you yeah. you can't override people's personal choice. Right. So someone can still choose to be angry or grumpy or whatever, even if you're at a place of peace and rest, if they choose to. You know, mm -hmm. you can force them into being at rest, but you can create an environment where it makes it easier for them to be at rest and which they feel and sense that. But if they're angry or they're bitter or resentful, then, you know, that is only creating an environment where they can choose to enter rest. But to stay in rest, they're going to have to deal with their let go of their anger or bitterness or whatever else. You know, it, it, it always means mm. an individual has to come into agreement with God over right. it. You know, otherwise, God, OK. No, no I, this may seem off the wall, but I felt like the Lord revealed to me regarding the, you know, the way the spiritual and the physical are mirroring each other in some way that I don't yet fully understand, obviously, that Jesus was actually, I mean, I know scripture says that, you know, there was nothing in his physical appearance that you could look upon him. But then in reality, of course, he is the transfigured Jesus completely perfectly beautiful but very essentially that he just kind of masked in some way in order to not be too offensive well to the other humans yeah i mean i think i think when when we read something like that we're trying to figure out some sort of interpretation of what it meant and mm -hmm. there are lots of different ways you could look at that one being well 
he he wasn't radiating light and different from other people mm. in a in a normal sense so they look upon him and they didn't see anything and he wasn't dressed ostentatiously he didn't have a right. crack in his head you know he didn't he didn't do those things to show off or to mm. demonstrate everything he came to serve and not be served so there was there was a sense where he didn't want to draw attention to himself in a physical way mm. that could potentially cause people to react to him wrongly to trigger them yeah <laughs> yeah you know um okay. and of course he also wanted to demonstrate to us that what he did he did as a man as a son of man a son of god not fully as man a, yeah he didn't do it because god could do it he did it because he was showing what sons could do in relationship right. with the father yeah he's the blueprint of us yeah basically you know hence yeah. he did what he saw the father doing i mean he could have done whatever you know if he chose to but actually he never chose to do anything independently of his relationship with the father and therefore the heart of the father and his heart were one yes. you know, there was never a chance that he was going to do anything outside of the father's heart although he could have done but he he was of course in relationship he was never going to do so but that gives us the indication that we get to choose to come into agreement mm -hmm. with the father's heart we chose yeah. independence as as a or adam chose independence on our behalf effectively um but when we then choose to come into a relationship you know it isn't automatic you know what i mean it's, it, it, we we always have to come to that point of surrender and agreement. and agreement yeah it's not just oh it's automatically i'm a son of god everything is perfect i'll never do anything wrong we have to choose to make those choices aligned to following the path of the father's heart rather than following any individual independent path because the choices are always there you have but you we have to form the arc with agreement yeah yeah you, you form your agreement you come into that agreement with the father's heart but eventually it becomes a state of being right is more because you, you like reality. specifically you mike parsons you're walking in that agreement you know yeah yes. and generally when it comes to something which feels like i have a choice here then i'm not going to go against that that conscious awareness of the father's heart because i don't want to right but i could you know and sometimes you get a sense where it feels like well i could do something here or not what's mm. the father's heart but generally it becomes more of a lifestyle you live and a consciousness that you have a stage mm -hmm. of being rather than doing mm -hmm. so i live in that state of being where mm -hmm. the father's heart is communicated to me because we're face to face and heart the heart all the time we're yes. never out of relationship which is what jesus had with the father him and the father were one right. well, they were one being in the sense well it depends what how you view god obviously in terms right, of right. Aryan view but jesus was here on earth and the father was in him and in heaven if you like but and that was the sort of the connection to the spiritual and the physical realm mm -hmm. they're both created realms for us to engage God also wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry. I know I'm interrupting you. Hmm. You just cooked my noodle. Okay. What do you mean by the spiritual realm being? I mean, I kind of get it, but you got to say more about that being a creative realm. Well, God lives in a non created realm of his eternal presence. So you, we call it eternity, if you like. Right. So God dwells his actual person father son spirit dwell in that realm that is a realm outside of time and space and that's the realm that him. you're dwelling in with him and that jesus was dwelling in with him when he was on earth um yes and no i mean <laughs> it's it can get complicated in the the heavenly realms are created just like the physical realms are created it's just a different dimension of creation right 
It's yes. a higher dimension of creation. Well, yes, it's a realm of creation that we were designed to operate in heaven and earth together. So they would work together simultaneously and seamlessly. That was how it was designed. But they said we when man chose to walk independently of that and heaven and earth separated in its connection. So restoration is bringing it back together. So heaven and earth function in a union and oneness. But God dwells, his presence dwells within that realm. But he lives, is his being, is within the eternal realm. And the created we, realm, the physical realm, are actually aspects of where he has created within himself something which is has time associated with it. Yes. Whereas there is no time associated with the eternal realm. But we can still access it. You know, I access the eternal realm and I access the realm where there's no time. So that means I can access the path, if you like. Mm. Um, so but generally the, the spiritual realm and the physical realm are created realms created to be in union and to work together with the spiritual and physical dimension. But actually, we are in the place where they're being reconnected with right. us. Second Corinthians five, the ministry of reconciliation. Well, God has reconciled everything to himself. And, yes. he, and that then brings together all of the creational realms. So the dimensional realms, the physical realm, the, what we call the spiritual realm are all designed to work together in harmony. Can you say a little bit about what exists outside of the eternal realm? I'm sorry, other people in the call. <laughs> nothing because there's nothing there is nothing outside of god right i know but outside of the eternal realm we know there's the physical realm and there's the spiritual yeah. realm what are some of the other realms well there's there is a dimensional realm in which the physical creation has dimensions associated with it which also are realms um dimensions I, there's a like heaven is so let's say heaven's a dimension and heaven right. has six realms okay so kingdom of god kingdom of heaven 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 of heavens perfection and eternity within and they're all created but within that realm then there's the physical realm that has our physical universe and all the planets and the stars and everything but also within this physical realm there are dimensional spaces which you can't see but you can go into and they are also have created dimensional beings that live there and these are like the angels and the various things that are living in various dimensions which i've heard you talk about in well, they're, they're know, not angels. angels dwell within the spiritual spiritual and realm but they're dimensional beings Let's but there say. are different dimensions to the physical realm and there are beings that are from those dimensions yeah. of the physical realm that we are not maybe currently seeing is that right well, they live in other dimensions, but some have engaged this dimension. So what are those dimensions like called or something? Um, well, they I don't know. I mean, I don't <laughs> know. I, have, I haven't given them particular names. I mean, I think I've been to 250 odd different ones over over the last five or six years. Uh, so there's quite a lot of them. With you. you know, and they have they have access into this realm usually through portals which are out in the constellations there's also a place where the father gave me access to those realms from the realm of heaven um which was beyond you know my experience at that point but then the father opened up a realm where i could engage there but they couldn't engage this realm or the heavenly realm it was like he, he showed me a portal. I could access that portal. There was an ante room in that portal that those beings could come and I could engage with them. Yeah. So, okay, let me, if I can clarify, because I don't, I mean, just theoretically, let's hmm. just take Mars, okay, whatever. Let's just yeah. say that on the other side of Mars that we've never been to, there's, hmm. you know, little green men walking around doing their thing, whatever they do. It, that's not another dimension though no. that's still in our physical dimension yeah, because mars is our physical dimension and yeah. these are other okay personally i don't believe in 
other beings within this dimension. Okay. Because I understand what you're saying. I you think that in the physical universe, it's Earth. Us. Yeah, I think this, gonna... this dimension was created for us. Yes. So that we could fill this dimension and expand the kingdom, God's garden, if you like, out into populate the other planets, moons, stars, things by yes. a gateway system of travel and communication without having to go by, you know, spaceships or whatever. And you can, there's a gateway system that connects with each of the planets of the solar system within the realm of north, south, east, west gates. You can engage those realms. There are gateways into this, into our solar system and beyond. And some of those dimensions are accessible from those gates. Um, yeah, there's, there's lots of stuff out there. There are beings assigned to the solar system some of them fell obviously and they they liked worship so they were worshipped as gods um mm. by man and, and they, those are idols yeah yeah effectively. Okay. Um, but there are also other beings there are elementals and guardians associated with each of the planets mm. and the planets themselves have sentience so you can connect with the planet right Right, in the same way that in some in, in in some way a tree is sentient. Yes, yeah, yeah. They, they are they have ability. Our ability as sons is to connect with creational realities, and yeah. there are elementals which God created to help man engage with these dimensional and elementals of the earth. So the earth itself has a core and a crust, and each of these things you can connect to. Um, wow. There is a sentience in the earth, which is a net mycelial network, which is formed with plants and, and trees, which right. means the planet itself has a connection. Creation has a, has a connection. I mean, how could creation be longing, waiting for the revealing of the sons of God? How could it's creation not. be groaning if it didn't have you know, a way of communicating and being communicated to? Right. Yeah. can you you can stop me can you say a little bit more because i've heard you say multiple times about the earth shield i don't really understand that well back in about 2020 a group of us were engaging every week um and we began to engage sort of creational realities and we engaged with light we engaged in a place um which if i it's, it's the background that often i put up on on these calls okay which, uh which is called I've definitely seen it it's the cosmic reef that one well we engaged within that portal and found a place that god described as the chamber of creation and in their light beings were waiting to be commanded to to form reality mm -hmm. and when we went in there and we engaged it god talked about the chamber of creation and how his voice and how we could speak and how and he said name these beings so they were living light and i think nancy cohen who was on the call she named them quantum lumens so they are the smallest particles of existence which form all reality. So they are light it's beings. Kind of like living. quarks in some way, like in oh, some smaller, some... smaller than that. Basically, the okay. smallest strings of energy that exist as living light. Um, and as we were engaging, the father said to connect each other with each other in a shield around the earth that was designed to protect the earth from external influence from other dimensional beings mm -hmm. and to be able to focus the attention into the earth to legislate and govern so we started doing that and angelic beings and the quantum lumens were all part of that shield so it was a, like a light shield but also a connecting of people in the earth in the shield is outside the atmosphere of the earth protecting the earth from external influence and that shield has increased in strength more and more people have engaged with it more and more people are functioning there and they can function outwards 
into the cosmos and into the dimensions there and they can also function inwards into the earth into the core of the earth into the atmosphere of the earth and begin legislating for the kingdom to be established on earth as it is in heaven right. so it's an in god has invited people to participate mm. in the earth shield and be part of the restoration of all things process really mm. I mean, were the quantum lumens so delighted to have you there? They were dancing and That's what I thought. Yeah, I mean, but they were waiting to be communicated with and spoken to. So there's a process that then the father showed me of brooding within the cr the cradle of life, um, and then um, as we become resonated with his heart and his thoughts and his mind then when we speak we speak as an oracle and then the chamber of of creation begins to vibrate with our voice and then light responds to us and reality <laughs> becomes formed and now we can do that around our lives all the time yeah. on a wider sphere you need union of hearts and minds with god's heart and mind to be able to do that for a wider sphere Hence, the Earth Shield enabled us to be able to begin to focus our intention aligned to the Father's heart towards the Earth for its restoration. Mm. Yeah. I can I ask you? I feel like the Lord showed me that, like global warming and stuff, is very essentially an outworking, and in, in the way that we've been talking about the spiritual and the physical being connected of people being afraid of running out of him. You know, they have a fear that what Jesus said about the river of life is not true, you know, and that they will be the foolish virgins without the oil. And oh. that that fear is manifesting in a very real way. I mean, partly through people's agreement with literal fake news, but, you know, and refusing to take responsibility in what they are doing. But mostly that it is a result directly of their fear of rejection or of not being one with him well i mean i think in general the frequency of the planet is lowered by fear and if people don't know who they are and don't know their sonship then they're going to be operating at a lower frequency and that will affect the planet itself it's complicated in that there's a difference between climate change and global warming and climate right. change happens in cycles and is to do with the sun. Yes. As we administrate the sun, we can mitigate climate change and bring about, as God intended, a temperate environment where everything would be fruitful and replenishing. But we have contributed to climate change dynamics with what we've done with the planet and therefore yes. affected that cycle. And therefore, we see global warming as a result of what we've done with with climate and gases and whatever, but also animals and our farming and husbandry of animals and all that stuff, because essentially methane is one of the big gases and most of the methane comes from animals, you know, um, but also, yeah, there's CO2 and everything else. So we've we've made it worse than the cycle mm -hmm. would have been anyway. But we can we need to as sons begin to legislate for the sun to stop harming the earth with mm. solar radiation in a harmful way. And that's part of bringing the solar system back into balance and harmony. The sun was not created to damage the earth. It was created oh. to create a a light without without the over extending heat or radiation which was harmful or damaging yes and since the sun and all the planets came out of sync and the sun in a sense has become the center of worship mm. uh, within the solar system it has taking on a role um which it was never intended to have it's become harmful because it's become an idol yeah yeah effectively okay. yeah um can I ask, okay, regarding the natural 
I didn't intend to ask any of these questions <laughs> regarding the natural climate change, but you're too good at this. Regarding the natural climate change cycle. Okay, so just for example, you're in England, the mini ice age, which ended in whatever, 1850 or thereabouts. Mm. Those cycles have been happening for forever and they yeah. are being exacerbated by our choices, potentially, yeah. the same way that everything is. Mm. And then because all of our choices ripple out, were those cycles like the mini ice age and then coming into a more temperate period, like in the late 19th century and going forward, th were those cycles naturally putting us more in tune with what God intended and setting things more temperate and more right and more fertile? And then we came in and basically messed it up between our agreement and legis and like physical legislation, like actual laws and physical choices and stuff like that. Um it's it's more that the the sun has been out of balance with what it was originally intended, how it was originally intended to function. Therefore, solar radiation, solar flares, solar activity is more volatile and as if it's acting angrily in mm. cycles. Now, you could say they were natural cycles or you could say they were just destructive cycles. I don't think God ever intended them. God wanted the earth and the solar system to be in harmony and balance, that everything was in, in, in a sense of creative state for habitation. Okay. Um, and we were supposed to fill the earth and extend the God government of God beyond the earth. The solar system would have been the next place we would have engaged, and then we would have gone beyond the solar system. Mm -hmm. But obviously it all got messed up. So essentially we're in a process of seeing it restored, but our relationship with it has to be restored and our connection to creation and the beings that were assigned to creation have to be restored. Otherwise we're always seemingly at war and there's, there's never a sense of peace and rest. So it's always, you know, the sun is sort of, well, if you look at the sun, in a natural sense, it is very, very volatile. Mm -hmm. But we're only looking at it as it is now. Not it as who it is eternally in some weird sense. Well, I think it just wasn't like that before we chose to operate independently of God. Right. Yeah. Now, is the, okay, so when you talked about, and, and this part, I you know, kind of know, but I want to extend it. When you talked about the, you know, us going and let's say populating Mars with whatever is native to Mars and whatever would be, you know, ruling and having dominion, flourishing, you know, mm -hmm. growing, creating there. Um, is that the millennium in some very real sense is when things mm -hmm. are at least set to a point of reconciliation where we have as humanity crossed over into something where we can easily let's say, go to Mars and not completely necessarily without friction or challenge, but we can make those changes and do exactly what the original mandate was. Um, no, I don't believe in a millennium at all. I okay. think that's, that's a man. I mean, theoretically, tactic. though, is that maybe what God meant? Like, now well, think, you will be able to grow these things there. Yeah, I mean, I think we can, we will be able to terraform those places. I think originally they would have not needed. They have different purposes and not all the planets were created to be habitable. So Jupiter has got such a mass that it was designed to protect the other planets from asteroids and other things hitting them because it absorbs yeah, because it's got it's bigger than all the other planets put together. Right. It's gravity is sucking gravity things is sucking. into it. Yeah. Yes. And that was why it was created. So it was created to form a, a an environment where you wouldn't have all these disruptions. So that each of the planets had a purpose, but they have moons which were designed to be habitable. So we should is be that able like to our guest house? Is the moon like the Earth's guest house? I I mean the Earth the the Moon again. It, people have different different ideas of what they think the Moon was designed for. Some people think it was never intended, but it happened through other things. I believe it talks about God establishing the Sun and Moon and stars as a picture of government and to bring you know a sense 
their governors and they revolve and they're to do with time and seasons and things like that. So if we didn't have the moon, we wouldn't have seasons. We wouldn't have tides. We wouldn't have lots of things which are to do with cycles of the moon. Um, so I believe that the moon has a purpose. Mm -hmm. But that purpose probably has been thwarted over time. And if you look at the surface of the moon, it looks pretty much that it's suffered a lot of damage. Right. It looks scarred. It does. And again, I don't think that was God's intention. Now, are the, OK, so the moon controlling the tides. I mean, very essentially are like the constellations and stuff sort of I don't have the language for this, but is it sort of the mechanism by which the other physical things are happening like it's in some way it's like the factory that's spitting out like you know this is how the tide is going to work i'm the moon and then the constellations are like and this these are the other things that gonna ha are going to happen as we move is it sort of like that um the actual solar system itself each of the planets was designed with purpose and to be in harmony with the earth Mm -hmm. So Saturn produces frequencies that were designed to uh, bring about a replenishing atmosphere on the Earth. Mm. Uh, other planets had different purposes, um, but those purposes have been corrupted. So first of all, our responsibility is to restore the balance and harmony and the relationship between the planets and to see those planets begin to function and bring harmony so that the Earth and the, the planet and the solar system can be a pattern for the rest of the universe to come back into balance and harmony in a sense the constellations and um, the Maseroth as they were known in the in the Hebrew basically was the outer wheel where where the constellation cycled every 24,000 so hundred years um, now there's an inner wheel and an inner wheel, which are designed a wheel within a wheel within a wheel to bring all of that back so that it's not we're not subject to it, but we're, that is subject to us. Right, because we're not because we are not to be governed by the times no. we are to govern the time. That's right. And therefore, there's a sense where we have to learn to govern the season times and seasons and not be subject to them. Mm. Um, now, obviously, we have a, you know, complicated connection to it all that's in process of being restored so it's not as it it was intended to be but we're working at it and ultimately everything will be restored back to god's original intention and purpose as we would be rather than as it was so adam was sinless but not perfected if he had continued to follow the walk with the father he would have become perfected and all of the sons would have been perfected in their identity um just easily in like it would have been done sense. with ease instead of with toil which is what yeah. has happened we've done it with toil yeah and essentially we would have ascended into an ascended state of co-creatorship with mm. god but yes. Adam walked independently. Man has created humanistic solutions to a lot of things. Um, and they've been very creative and because we're made in the image of God, but they wouldn't have been how it would have been if Adam had not chosen independence. But mm. he did. Therefore, we now look to see restoration to where, where things would be if Adam hadn't have fallen. Not Which in my that. thinking is like, that's what God meant by the millennium. It's not a literal thousand years. It's just like, hey, y'all, now you can set this right in the same ease and rest that Adam would have had he not fallen. Yeah, it's just the state that God desired us to dwell in. It's Eden. Yeah, yeah. Eden expanded to fill the universe, basically, yeah. Now, when Jesus came... Was he in, I mean, I know who Jesus is, obviously, on some level. But when he came and was born, you know, in the manger, was he, was he the Adam? Was he the Adam in Eden? Is that how he was a baby? Like, he was, no. lit, he had, he was the unascended son in some way when he was born. And as he's growing up, oh. he's sinless, but he's becoming the ascended Adam. It's more like he represented fallen man, not perfected man, and therefore could deal with our 
lost identity and restore it. He identified with us fully, which is why he would say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The right. father said, so Jesus, he just felt we, like it. we felt it. We felt like he'd forsaken us. He right. never did. But we felt that because we felt lesser because of our independence. So we'd lost our state of union and relationship. So we felt like we were separated from God and that God had separated from us, but he never did. So Jesus yeah. came to completely change that dynamic and bring about a restored, reconciled relationship. But it was only from our part. He wasn't trying to change God's mind. He was changing our minds. He was changing our hearts, not God's. God had always loved us. He'd never changed. We're always in. So God made it possible for us there to come into that reconciled relationship. Um, so Jesus was the son of man, the son of God, but he wasn't Adam. He, he, he was, you could say the Bible describes him as the last Adam. Right. So where the first Adam did this, Jesus came as the final completion of what to restore what Adam had done um in that way but were his genetics adam before the fall or adam after the fall as a human baby well he was neither because he was god so right he was not, he was not the, the the holy spirit placed a fertilized egg into mary the ova wasn't mary's and the sperm wasn't joseph's so jesus was not a a human as coming from Mar mary or joseph mm. he was a created being in a sense of the son of god in human form and his genetics would have been as ours should have been obviously mm. um and obviously wanting to bring us back into that restored relationship where our genetic material comes back into the fullness of god now ultimately that would have been we started off with three strands of dna we lost the light strand of dna when our spirit disconnected and that was restored but we would eventually take on the nine other strands of god's dna because mm, we have the three but right now we just have the two well we have three we had the three yeah we're, well we've got three because our spirit is the is the third strand of light if you like that brings about the union oh, that's the dna reality. that that cannot be seen under a microscope is that yeah. accurate yeah i guess but we're okay. talking dna really just as a a, a way of ex trying to explain something it's not real right DNA no i know i know <laughs> yeah it's but it's it's the practical it's our, outworking let's say our makeup, the abstract our yes. makeup is spirit soul and body therefore that's right. presented in a way but ultimately, if we had matured, we would have matured on the nine stones or fire stones into 12 stones. So ultimately, the high priest had 12 stones of government, which is man and God in government together. And then the 12 goes back into the one. Is that right? Well, yeah, ultimately, you, you, you realize that we are, we're designed and created for oneness. Well, actually, I do have something um, in the conversation you are having. I thought about Jesus when he was praying, and uh, he was teaching the disciples to pray in the Our Father. Now, I would think that the Lord would, would have taught the disciples a lot more about prayer in detail while he was here. Do you recall any... Uh, anything that goes deeper than that or was he just well, trying to teach the uh, disciples to have a uh, relationship well you've got you've got to sort of understand that jesus was operating in an old covenant setting and mm -hmm. therefore what jesus taught the disciples mostly was how to connect in an old covenant cycle so when he was saying, you know, our father, our heaven, he wasn't saying this is what we should be doing in the new covenant. He was just saying, look, you need to connect to God now. See God in heaven and earth and the kingdom being established and all those things. This is going to change your dynamic of relationship with God in this way. But when Jesus started to 
uh, talk about the new covenant. And that specifically is talked about is in John's gospel. The whole of John's gospel comes out from a different dynamic completely because Jesus is now talking to disciples who are following him. And he talks about love and who he was. I am the way, the truth and the life. You know, I am the bread of life. You know, all those seven I am statements and everything else. They're not mentioned in any of the other gospels because in those other gospels, Jesus is trying to get them to follow him, leave Judaism, leave the old covenant and law behind and follow him. So he's challenging them and therefore challenging the, the Pharisees and those who are trying to lead them astray and keep them in the old system. He's trying to follow, get them to follow him out of that old system. So he warns them about what the end of the old system would be and the collapse of the old system and the end of the temple and the end of the old system of sacrifices and offerings and all that stuff. And he warns them what's going to happen. And he's basically saying, follow me out of that system and come into the new covenant, which is coming through me, my blood, my body given for you. And then, but John, who had a more intimate relationship with the father, and it talks about laying on his chest, you know, that's with Jesus. John's gospel is the revelation of the new covenant of those who are already following him. So you get when Jesus talks about, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength. That's the old, that's old covenant. It's not new. No, I'm so that's what it was under the law. That's the best they could do under the law. But in the new, love one another as I've loved you. So it's all now I love you. You can love. You don't have to try with all your strength to do this. Let me love you. Now you can love. Totally different dynamic in the new covenant. Because it's not based in works. It's based in grace. So when John talks about, you know, a new commandment I give unto you, love one another as I've loved you, that's not mentioned in the other ones. Because they were, he was still trying to get them out of the old covenant. So he didn't want to, when he was talking to the Pharisees and he's talking to those, but when he's talking to his disciples in the context of the new covenant, then the whole passage from John 12 to John 17 is all about this sort of new life. You know, the world will know you're my disciples by your love for one another. You know, Jesus talking about on the resurrection day, you're going to know that I'm in you and you're in me and we're in the father. And this new relationship is going to be established. None of that is in the other three gospels because the other three gospels are focusing on getting people out of the old covenant into the new. And John's gospel is really describing what the new is like. Hmm. So. Jesus wasn't talking about prayer because you don't I don't think you find the Lord's Prayer in John's Gospel. As we call it, the Lord's Prayer. So Jesus was therefore saying, look, this is this is how you can engage God at the moment. But actually, it's going to change when you follow me, because I'm going to lead you into a new and living way, if you like. So a lot of what Jesus said wasn't speaking to us today it was speaking to them then but john's gospel was speaking to all those who would follow him into the future but most of the other stuff is really very much some of its history some of it's what happened to him some of it's you know the cross and what happened on the cross and all of that you know in matthew's gospel and what he was telling them to do in the transition and Matthew 24, all of that, what was being going to be the end of the old and beginning of the new, all of that was in the context of they were still, you know, Israel or theirs in Jerusalem were still following that old covenant system. And he warned them not to stay in Jerusalem, but to leave <laughs> and follow him. But obviously some did and some didn't. Um, so you you have them you know ending up in Jerusalem when it was besieged to bring about the end of the old in AD 70. So a lot of what Jesus was talking about was very much specifically talking in a context to Jewish people following Judaism so that they could leave Judaism and follow him. That's some of the parables, you know, where he's talking about, you know, the different dynamics of the kingdom and he's talking to them about some of the parables about you know the god coming and sending the prophets and then sending his son and then rejecting him and all, all of that is in that context 
So, you know, I wouldn't be looking to get doctrine from Matthew, Mark and Luke primarily because it was very much in an old covenant setting. But we have a very different setting when it comes to John and the revelation that Jesus gave to John, which I think most of it was for us and still applies. Because I, I noticed, I noticed that later on, Paul in Hebrews 6, 1 and 2, he was trying to talk to him about, uh, about these old uh, practices, you know, it's like, why do we keep, why did we fall into that? <laughs> it's just amazing. I, I don't get that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Hebrews very much was written to say, hey, don't keep following the old covenant. Hence, you know, Hebrews 6, don't lay again a foundation of repentance and dead works, faith in God. That's all old covenant stuff. We don't need faith in God when we've no, when we know God. That was what they needed when they didn't know him. Mm -hmm. Repentance from dead works. Well, they had to change their whole thinking from what they did do, which was the sacrificial system, no longer applying that in the new. You know, laying on our hands, baptisms or washings ceremonial losses you know wasn't talking about laying on of hands to pray for someone it was saying laying on the hands to transfer your sin into an animal which is what they did you know that's a foundation that's don't need anymore you know so hebrew 6 is what most people teach their foundation series of church about and actually it's saying don't lay this foundation this is old don't do that it's an old system don't bring it into the new but people have just taken that and said, oh, we need to teach about repentance and dead works and faith in God and, you know, baptisms. And oh, I did it myself. And we had a whole series of teaching based around Hebrews 6. As, well, these are the foundations we need to teach people. But in reality, they were, do not lay again this old covenant foundation. You know, and it, it's very much something we should be very careful that we don't do. You know, because it, it is mixing of covenants and a lot of what we call christianity today is a mixture of covenants because people think everything that jesus said applies to them today so we should try and love god with all our heart all our strength all our mind and neighbors no all we have to do is let him love us and love others in the same way it's so much simpler than following a whole set of rules and you know festivals and because he, they're all types and shadows of Jesus being the fulfillment of every promise of God. And all the old covenant things that God made is fulfilled in Jesus fully and completely without human interaction. Because a lot of what the old covenant is about is what Moses gave to them because they didn't want a relationship with God because of fear. God never intended a sacrificial system of religion. You know, he wanted relationship. They didn't want relationship. So he allowed them to set up a way that there could be something, but they still didn't do it. They still didn't follow it. You know, and they, 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 couldn't, they couldn't fulfill it. How could they ever be good enough without grace? But then we're saved by grace through faith, not of our own. So it's not even our faith that saves us. It's his faith in us, not our faith in him. You know, which changes the whole dynamic away from religion into relationship. And that's what he's looking for. Simple relationship, which will bring about the change and transformation of who we are into who he has always known we are. We get to know who we really are through that relationship which is son of god yeah. and it seems to me like we're at that same place today because we're we're ready to move into the next thing that yahweh wants to do and everybody's stuck in what has happened in the last hundred years or 200 years or three or five yeah absolutely i mean because i don't know about you but if i start trying to talk about you know some of the entering in and some of the i mean that's just basic but some of this other uh stuff that we're entering into and understanding man their eyes glaze over and they want to go back to history yeah 
because ultimately those systems are things that they have developed and they're comfortable with and they're, and they're secure with. yeah and they're secure in it and but they were never god's intention mm -hmm. so i don't believe god is going to uh restore the church as an institution because i don't think he ever wanted the church as an institution in the first place what he's going to do is actually establish the ecclesia of which is people in relationship with him and each other with a kingdom governmental perspective to establish heaven on earth which is very different from you know what we see as church it's known yeah. as church god didn't intend that not yes. to say that he hasn't used it because he's you use people you'll work with people but it's not his intention and yeah there's so much better when we enter into that which god has for us to enjoy yeah. and to celebrate and take all the works and labor and toil out of it you know, yeah, I keep telling people, I don't think that uh, e people or even church people really understand the kingdom of God. And they it's very possible that if they did get a glimpse of it, they wouldn't like it. Hmm. Well, maybe. Yeah, because <laughs> it would like probably it because it, it's, it's, have to close up. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not about their rules. And it's not about that. Yeah, they'd have to shut down all their systems, all their organizations, <laughs> shut yeah. it all down. And just get back to the simplicity of relationship and love. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus didn't say, oh, your great organizational structures will show that you're my disciples. He said it's your love for one another. And that's what the world is looking for. They're not looking for another corporate system. They've got enough of those already and they don't work either. So why set up the church to be an organization? Because it's man made. Yeah. The true church or the true ecclesia, which is the word, because the church, word church is not obviously a biblical word. Ecclesia is had a completely different understanding and meaning to what we now have called church. Right. And actually what we have called Christianity. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't come to set up another religion. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I hadn't hadn't thought of it that way, um, that the first three gospels are jesus talking them out of the old system and john was talking him into the next that's a that's a beautiful concept i hadn't thought of that before that's good yeah 